Hello, and welcome to Old Ways in New Jersey. I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host. Previously on Old Ways in New Jersey, we've talked about traditional folk musicians from central New Jersey, old houses dating back to the 18th century, but today we're going to try something different. Our guest today is Phil Schreiber. He's a central Jersey resident and a U.S. Navy veteran, and he has a very unusual hobby. As a teenager growing up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, he took up the hobby of stamp collecting. You might well ask, what's so unusual about that? Well, the thing is, within the universe of stamp collecting, he specializes. He doesn't just collect stamps, he collects the whole envelope. In particular, he collects envelopes that have been sent from ships. This includes Navy and Coast Guard ships from many different countries. So it's my pleasure to welcome Phil Schreiber to our studio today. What an interesting hobby you have, Phil. Um, let's start with some basic questions. Uh, what is a naval cover? It's an envelope that was sent through the mail from a Navy ship or installation. That's all. We it, use the word cover instead of envelope. Okay. And on these covers, they're postmarks. Uh, what is a postmark and what information can we glean from a postmark? Okay. The postmark authenticates the time and the place of origin of the uh, envelope. So it's a documented artifact, in effect. It's exactly that. And, and then uh, what is a cachet and how are they designed? A cachet is an additional printing to the envelope that's put on privately. Uh, in n collecting these envelopes, People want to commemorate or note something, uh, and they put it right on the envelope. Usually on the left-hand side. Yes, because on the right-hand side goes the postage stamp, the postmark, and the address. Okay, okay. And what is, just to fill us in, what is the difference between, say, uh, philatelic mail and postal history? Philatelic mail is uh, describes mail that's you uh, that was created just for collectors the other stuff is mail through the normal course of events it wasn't created for for itself so postal history is real mail from one real person to another real person. Exactly. For, for, an, for an ordinary, everyday purpose. Exactly. Okay. Now, uh, can you form such a collection without spending a lot of money? Yes. As a matter of fact, most people get started in it uh, because the covers they want are readily accessible to them. I have a friend who specializes in covers from the city of New Brunswick. Huh. And each one can be considered an artifact because it has a story behind it that's authenticated by the time on the postmark and the location of New Brunswick. Huh. And as a collector, uh, can you send off for your own covers? If you want the postmark of a certain time or a certain and ship. place, you just write a letter to someone there. And if you don't know anyone there, the postmaster in the post office is there. Write to him. Uh. Just write postmaster wherever he uh. is. Well, let's talk about some specific examples. Uh, I understand uh, you grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. You're about 13 years old. Uh, Tell us about your very first cover. My very first cover was given to me by my older brother, who was a cover collector. And he wrote 
for uh, he collected coverage that had a, some sort of historical significance, and he had written to a Navy ship that was carrying people, military people, back and forth between the United States and anywhere in the Pacific Ocean to China. He saw that they had it somewhere that they had their own postmark, so he wrote to the mail clerk on the ship. What, what was the ship? Do you remember? The USS Henderson. Okay. And when he got it back, he says, you know, I'm collecting enough things as it is. Would you like to have this cover? And I said, yeah, I'm fascinated by ships and places. So I began writing to ships. So that's how this whole thing got started. Yes. Um, I, I know that a lot of these uh, covers have a personal story behind them. Can you tell us about the uh, cover from the destroyer Jacob Jones back in 1941? The Jacob Jones uh, was a destroyer uh, that operated off the New Jersey coast during the uh, battle for the Atlantic. Uh, when submarines would come right up to the Atlantic coast. And although we weren't in a war at that time, uh, we were sending supplies to England. And Germany sought to destroy that by sinking their ships. With German U-boats. U-boats. Yeah. And the Jacob Jones, uh, one of my uh, fellow high school <laughs> friends, was in a crew of that. Huh. And he had joined the Navy. He was a little older than me. What was his name? Charles Idarola. Huh. And uh, he was on duty on a Jacob Jones when it was sunk, with a lot of loss of life. And he lost his life on a Jacob Jones when it was sunk. So, so you have the cover from the ship prior to its being sunk. Uh, yes, you can't get it after it's sunk. Yeah. And, and, so, and so this is a very personal connection because you knew the guy. Yes. Yeah. But sometimes you communicated not with people you knew personally, but with famous people. Uh, can you tell us, for example, about uh, the cover from uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr.? Yes. When Charles Idarola joined the Navy before the war even started, Many other people were doing it because we n everybody felt we were going to go to war uh, against Germany and Japan. Sooner or later. Yes. And the younger sons of many famous people, such as the President of the United States, volunteered to join. Franklin Roosevelt had four or five sons, and Franklin D. Uh, Roosevelt Jr. was assigned to the destroyer Mayran. Hmm. So I felt that I'd like a postcard from a uh, famous person, and I wrote to him, and he wrote back to me. Very kind, yeah. Yes. Uh, and, and a little bit surprising, even. He, he could have ignored it. Very true. Huh. And some of your covers document uh, famous events. For example, I believe you have a cover in your collection that documents the meeting between FDR and Churchill. Yes. Uh, before, here again, even before the war started, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt would meet, usually on the high seas, uh, aboard a warship. and. Uh, I w uh, it was usually announced beforehand, and you could write to these ships. Hmm. And uh, I didn't write to Roosevelt or Churchill himself, <laughs> uh, but I wrote to the equivalent of a postmaster on the ship called the mail clerk. Yeah. And that was the, the Mayrant. Uh, uh, the Mayrant actually was escorting uh, Roosevelt to one of, to uh, Newfoundland, and uh, the uh, Roosevelt was on a large ship, a cruiser. The, was that the Houston? Uh, I think it was the Houston. Yeah. Yes, and the Mayran was its escort. I see. 
and uh, the postal clerk uh, put in the postmark what's called a slogan. Uh, it says uh, presidential escort. Nice. Because he had the liberty to do so. Yeah. Yes. And uh, so often we've talked about this before. Sometimes you were able to get a cover from a ship before it sunk. Uh, can you show us your cover from the USS Arizona, which is a pretty famous ship? Yes. I wanted to have a cover from every battleship in the Navy. So I wrote, I got a list of them, it's readily available. And a year before the Arizona was sunk, I wrote to it. And uh, he sent me back his postmark, just what I wanted for the ship. Yeah. Now, this is a true artifact of the Arizona, which is but, sunken at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. But you got it when it was alive and well. Yes. Yeah. And then some 50 years later, I believe you designed a cover that uh, commemorated uh, the Pearl Harbor attack of December 7th, 1941. Can you tell us a little bit about the design? Yes. Uh, uh, people can design their own postmarks for a special reason and submit it to the post office of the town where it's going to be used. For approval. Or? For approval, yeah. Uh, I uh, created a postmark uh, commemorating Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th. I couldn't get it postmarked on the Arizona because it was yeah, sunk. Yeah, yeah. But I thought I asked the uh, captain of the Missouri, which was the <coughs> ship where the surrender took place. And uh, I designed a postmark for the battleship Arizona to use on December 7th on the 50th anniversary, and he approved of it. Huh. And it's kind of interesting, the Missouri was a battleship named for a state, just like Arizona's named for a state. Mm -hmm. And they say that uh, the reason the surrender took place was Missouri was Harry Truman's home state. That's true, yeah. because the flagship was actually the New Jersey, and Admiral Halsey chose the New Jersey as his flagship because he was a native of New Jersey, and he was looking forward to bringing it into Tokyo Bay for the surrender when Truman said, oh no, <laughs> I'm from Missouri, I outrank you. <laughs> you have a cover, I believe, that marks the creation of the Amphibious Force Atlantic Fleet, December 23rd, 1941. Let's take a look at that. Yes. And. Um, I understand from what you've told me that the Navy really didn't want that mission at all. C can you elaborate on that? Yes. First of all, the amphibious force uh, is what its name implies. It's a part of the Navy that goes on land as well as sea. And they need something like that to bring troops where, the, where they're fighting. The hierarchy of the Navy didn't want that. They believed the Navy's mission was just to fight sea battles, and that if we're to transport troops, let somebody else do it. Maybe the Merchant Marine. Uh, yes. But uh, the Navy Department, the civilian hierarchy of the Navy, said, uh, we're not going to get people to volunteer for that sort of duty, you know, to land themselves right in the middle of battle. We won't get enough people anyway. Yeah. So they ordered the Navy to create an amphibious force of ships that would land the troops on the various battlefields, Normandy, mm -hmm. Iwo Jima, Okinawa. And uh, a postmark was announced for the first amphibious force personnel at their post office. And I wrote to the mail clerk to get it, and I asked him just what is the amphibious force, because it hadn't been announced. And 
he wrote back and he explained that the on, the on the other side of the postcard. Yes, on the other side of the postcard, uh, and he had created a cachet <laughs> ah. himself, which showed a soldier riding a turtle, which is an amphibian. Yeah. And he said that the purpose of the amphibious force is for us to do to Japan what they're currently doing to us. They were invading all of these islands out in the Pacific, which we eventually had to go fight on. Mm, yeah. Now, as I recall, May the 6th, 1943, you turned 18 years old. Do you still have your original draft notice? Yes, I do. Well, let's take a look at it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, May 6th was the date the, the draft notice was sent to me. Uh -huh. It was sent to me about six, five months after I turned 18. Oh, I see. I was in high school at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I had gone to join the Navy previously, and I was rejected uh, for physical reasons. And uh, when I went for the draft, uh, answered the draft notice, uh, I told them I wanted to go in the Navy. So they said, if you volunteer to go in, you can choose your service. So the draft notice was my way of getting back in the Navy. Actually, I, I didn't pass that physical either. Uh, but I pointed out that I know people who are in worse shape than me who are in. So the examining doctor said, I'll pass you. And uh, off I went to boot camp uh, uh, <laughs> right after graduation. Was there an understanding that you would go into the amphibious fleet? Not really. Not explicitly. Not explicitly. What happened was the Navy, which had objected to the amphibious fleet, uh, said in order to man it, to get enough people, they would have to reduce their standards. So they would take people who ordinarily wouldn't be in the Navy. Mm. Uh, not only people who wore eyeglasses, which they wouldn't take, or had punctured eardrums, which they wouldn't take, but convicts. Uh, if someone was convicted and imprisoned for a, a uh, nonviolent act, he could volunteer and be released from prison and get a reprieve from the rest of his sentence. So my ship was made up to a large extent of people who didn't like to point out their own misgivings. <laughs> their own shortcomings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, I understand that a lot of uh, Navy mail clerks uh, were themselves collectors. Uh, yes. Oftentimes, their rating was of yeoman, which is sort of like a ship's secretary. Yes. And as such, they would have good rapport with the captain, so they might even be able to uh, design their own fancy cancels. I believe you have such an example in your collection. Yes, the destroyer Leary had a mail clerk named John Bodish, who was a collector and liked to design his own postmarks. But John was unusual. He was not a yeoman, he was a gunner's mate. That is unusual, yeah. Very unusual. The yeoman. To the yeoman, it's just added work being the, uh, a mail clerk. Yeah. But if someone likes working with the mail, like John Bodish did, they, they say, okay, if you want to take over that part of his job. <laughs> Be my guest. Yeah. yeah. I think you also have a cover from John Bodish when he was on a receiving ship. Yes. A receiving ship in the Navy is an, usually an old warship that's turned into a barracks that houses sailors who are waiting for their regular ship to come in. Uh, John Bodish uh, left the Leary and some other ships, uh, as he kept getting promoted uh, in the yeah. Navy, uh, he would be assigned a different ship where his experience could be further utilized. And uh, he wrote to me from the Bremerton, Washington Navy Yard receiving ship. Uh, and 
And you kept up with him for some time. Uh, yep, until he died. Um, you, I think by the end of the war, he was promoted to the rank of chief petty officer. Yes. Which is about as high as you can go as an enlisted man. It, it is as high as you can go and, at that um, time. And then um, he, he even sent you a, a cover from the USS Hanford, I believe. Yes. Let's take a look at that. Good. The USS Hanford was a, a transport, uh, sort of like the Henderson, as a matter of exactly, but a much newer version. Yeah. And he was assigned as a, uh, as the, uh, a chief gunner's mate mm -hmm. on it there. Now, now when you were in the Philippines, you got a number of interesting covers. Can you share one of them with us? Sure. Uh, there's one that wasn't sent to me. Uh, but was given to me. Uh, we were in the uh, invasion of the Philippines, and uh, I got this one cover issued by the Japanese government in the Philippines at the time. And it shows the Emmanuel Rojas, who was the puppet president of the Philippines. Uh, I got it in the town of Tacloban, and uh, I'd been sent there to a hospital to get new glasses that were d broken. And uh, since I had time, I had to wait for the glasses to be made, I went to the post office in the town to get the latest stamps. And when a guy saw I was a stamp collector, he sent me to a, a local stamp dealer in the neighborhood who gave me that envelope uh, as a souvenir. Huh. And I, it's especially uh, valuable to me because of a personal connection. Uh, during one of the air attacks we were subjected to, we shot down a Japanese plane, and they, sir, we got the sur one of the survivors, and he spoke perfect English, and uh, he told us that he, he was a prisoner on your ship. He, we took him prisoner. Yeah. His name was uh, Sadeo Nakamura. He was 18 years old like me. He spoke perfect English. He learned it as a second language in high school yeah. in, on Shikoku. And he said that he was based in Manila. That's where he took off from before we shot him down. Ah. So it's... Uh, Cover and, that has and he explained the cover to you, uh, the Manuel Rojas being the puppet uh, yes. governor and so on, so on. Uh, Phil, when the war was over, you had to leave uh, LST number 991. Yes. Uh, and so uh, how did you mark that date? And what was the date? Uh, I left on November 6th. And November 6th, 1945. 45, and I went to the mail clerk got one of his post office official envelopes, and he gave me each of his postmarks that he used on mail, and they applied them to this envelope as a going away commemorative envelope for myself. You were celebrating your own departure? Yes. Okay. I was sent home on a cargo, sh a Navy cargo ship, the USS Kenmore. Uh, Unfortunately, I could never get a postmark from that ship. And uh, there were, I don't know how many thousand troops crammed onto this cargo ship. And uh, we were packed like sardines. Took 31 days from Hong Kong to San Francisco. So how did you pass your time during those 31 days? Actually, I ran crap games, oh. dice games. A friend of mine, not really uh, permissible to do, uh, but at the same time, uh, the officers looked the other way. It's the war's like a, over, yeah. Like if you double park yeah. in a street, it's illegal, and if you have a good reason, the policeman looks the other way. Yeah, yeah. And I would take a cut of each pot. So, so you uh, had a nice little steak when you got home. Yes. Yeah. And ha what were you able to do? Well, I got married when I got home, and I had enough money to buy a house, 
uh, using the cash for, uh, and to furnish the house. Very and nice. To buy a car. Yeah. Now, from time to time, the uh, LST crews of World War II held reunions, and some 63 years later, after 1945, you had a reunion in 2008. Can you show us the cover from that event? Yes. Uh. For each uh, reunion, I made up a special postmark for the city we had the reunion in. And we had a special cachet. And there was one cachet for this particular reunion. Uh, the postmark commemorated the LST uh, getting ready to invade the Philippines. And there was a one cachet which was of general interest commemorating the reunion. And as a fundraiser, there was another cachet which honored the person who was buying it. Individuals. Yeah, he submitted a picture of himself and he was put on a, on a cachet. So you put yourself on? On mine, I put myself, yeah. Okay. And uh, you were radio man second class at the time? Yes. Now, sometimes I know you collect uh, covers from foreign navies. Um, tell us the story about your attempts to get a cover from, the, from a Soviet aircraft carrier back in 2004. Okay, I tried to get mail from just about every foreign ship. Uh, some, were, some countries were very uncooperative, uh, and the Soviet Union was especially so. And news was broadcast that the Russians were building a new aircraft carrier. They didn't have any aircraft carriers, so this would be a first for them. And I wrote to the Soviet embassy in Washington to find out how I might get a mail to that ship. And uh, as a result, the uh, FBI apparently intercepted their reply to me, which told me nothing, really. They said they're passing the request on for a response. But uh, it turns out that the person who answered the letter was probably a spy. And I had a visit from the FBI asking why a spy would want to contact me. So there was a knock on your door from the FBI? By an FBI agent. Wow, and he went counter espionage. It, it, he didn't phone in advance or anything, just showed up on your doorstep. Exactly. Well, it must have been a little alarming at first. Well, it could have been, but it wasn't. I mean, since I hadn't done anything, I, and I didn't live in the Soviet Union, I... And you showed the guy your collection? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, for our... For our viewers who might be interested, uh, what can they do? I understand there's a national organization. Can you tell us about the national organization? Yes. Uh, the national organization is called the Universal Ship Cancellation Society. And anybody can join. Uh, just send yes. in the $24 or whatever. Yes. And, and then there, there are local meetings in Highland Park, I understand. Yeah, we have a chapter in New Jersey. It meets in Highland Park. And can, can people contact you about joining the local chapter? Yes. Yes, we, we're happy to have visitors who like to see what we're up to. Yeah. And uh, so we'll, we'll put the phone number and the, uh, and the email up on the screen. Good. Okay. Well, Phil, I want to thank you very much for sharing your fascinating hobby with us. And uh, keep collecting. Thank you. Okay.